But it was too good to be true, all this talk about open government and open campaigning, because a very nasty nuance developed in the back rooms of the Social Credit Party and the high-priced handlers this very day. And if the boys in the back room have their way, it will mean that all the candidates who've got no mind of their own, those candidates with no minds of their own, will be recreated in the image of charming, smiling Bill Van Der Zandt. And if I were in opposition, which I never would be, I would say the campaign is going to be entirely style without substance. What happened was that a couple of prearranged interviews that I'd set up for social creditors to debate with the NDP were cancelled. So I phoned up Aspinall at social credit headquarters, and I finally got a message relayed to me, thank you very much, Mr. David Poole, and here's Mr. David Poole's message to me. We are not prepared to advise our candidates to debate opposition candidates. We are quite happy to go on camera with an interview to be preceded or followed by an opposition candidate. We are simply following the Premier's lead in declining to debate Mr. Skelling. And the rule will probably apply to all candidates' meetings too. In other words, for God's sake, don't get involved in a situation where you might commit yourself or your party to one of your own opinions. This is the kind of thing I was afraid of, although not so afraid of, when Mr. Van der Zam told us all there'd be none of these fancy backroom buys. It would just be a straight, open, up campaign. I'm going to give the first test of this particular policy to a social credit candidate scheduled to debate with an NDP after you've seen the rundown from Steve. Got Mosby at the ball, well, and Bell. And really that's very Here is Kim Campbell, the woman who made the best leadership speech at Whistler by a country mile. Are you aware of this advice from Social Credit Headquarters not to debate opposition candidates, only to go on an interview by yourself and not, it would seem, to go to all candidates' meetings? No, I wasn't, but in fact, I mentioned it to somebody at headquarters this morning after when I was chatting about something else that I was coming down to do Webster, and nobody said anything. So you're quite prepared to interview, to debate with David Vickers? Well, it's not a debate, it's a friendly chat. Well, we'll see how that goes. Uh -huh. You, of course, wanted to be leader of the NDP, and you failed. That's right. Do you think there might be a vacancy for the leadership soon in view of recent disturbing developments in the NDP and Mr. Skelly? Actually, I doubt it very much, Jack, because we plan on winning, and we plan on being government uh, following the election this month. So I don't see an opening. And do you feel like a bit, a bit of an outsider being one of the old Bennett package? Uh, and are you upset at Mr. Van der Zam uh, lifting the lid on restraint? That's a nice question to answer in 25 words or less. First of all, I don't, well, I don't know that I'm part of the old Bennett package. I worked for Premier Bennett, and I like and admire him very much. Um, I established last night in my nomination that I am a grassroots politician. I don't owe my support to anybody. I don't owe my support to uh, old-timers or party establishment. And uh, as far as lifting the lid of restraint, I don't think the Premier has made rash promises in terms of dollars. I think what he said is that he wants to re-examine a lot of the spending priorities that were uh, that existed under restraint. Well, he's lifted the restraint on BCGU, HLRA, $450 million Island Highway, 13.6 Surrey Memorial, and many others. Mm -hmm. Take the tax off restaurant meals. Surely, is that the kind of fiscal move you expect when the province has got a current deficit of close to $900 million this year? Well, I think there's a general consensus that the purse strings can be loosened and there are things that have to be done. The Island Highway is a very good example. I mean, people are just screaming for it and it's ex extremely important in terms of the economic recovery on the island, the redevelopment and, and resurgence of the tourism Mr. industry Vickers. there. Well, it's, it's interesting that Kim raises the Island Highway because, of course, it was an idea that uh, came from the Democrats. Uh, the, the only part of the idea that the uh, social credit government hasn't uh, taken is the other three quarters of an integrated transportation policy. We talk about an island highway. We also talk about uh, dealing with the ferry situation. We talk about public uh, transportation and proving public utilities. And we talk also about rail. So when, uh, when we speak of transportation policies, we're talking about planning, integrated, long-term, not from the top of your bootstraps for an election. So you Real difference. This $450 million highway is the old Bennett blacktop to victory, isn't it? Well, 
I love your slogans. I really sort of can't. I was can't. trained by social credit. <laughs> oh. No, I mean the the, uh, the comprehensive transportation program that Mr. Vickers is talking about is obviously one that involves a much greater financial commitment. What happens when you're in a situation where the public purse is not as full as you'd like it to be is you have to set priorities and those decisions are very painful. The NDP has the luxury of making promises without having the responsibility of taking the tough decisions. Well you're making promises well, and may not have the money. I, it's interesting because I'm sure that I, I don't know if you've read the, uh, I, the economic strategy for Vancouver Island developed by the NDP yeah. candidates uh, Kim but the reality is that our economic strategy four points don't add up to what uh, Mr. Van der Zandt is going to blow without any planning. But she's There's a distinction, a though, between planning and dealing with things off the top of your boots simply for an election to get elected. Well, who says that they don't have anything to do with planning? Well, I don't see any planning in anything that the social credit government's done. Well, maybe you're just not looking for it. Well, it's not there or to find. You wouldn't concede it it's if you saw it. It's not there to find. That's not true. I don't see any social planning. I don't see any planning around women's issues. I don't see any planning around poverty. I don't see a single thing. Well, I mean, I think you're absolutely wrong. We have policies and we have plans. What are your plans for women? We have a program within the Ministry of Labor for opening up employment about, possibilities for women. What about equal women. opportunity? What about equal pay for work, work of equal value? What well, about affirmative action programs? I don't think that there is a broad consensus in this province for the widespread application of equal pay for work of equal Are value. That, I think, that is a concept that is very, very complex and very, very difficult. Oh, and it's easy, it's easy to talk about. You're not uh, telling me that the women of this province aren't seeking equality and social justice. That's the issue. Of course they're the seeking issue equality and social justice, but not, not necessarily in your vocabulary or equal in your pay, terms. Equity, equal pay for work of equal, equal value. Who defines, action who, who defines what the equal a, value is? Well, there's a great deal of work. That's okay, can I come in and ask a question? You were very impressive in your speech and your little rat in your Whistler because you're the only one who seemed to have any feeling for education. Now, look at Mr. Van der Zand's record on restraint and education and the Bennett government. What would you do about, what would you recommend to Van der Zand about education? Well, I think the Premier has indicated already, in fact, I heard him today when he was out at UBC, uh, recommended re-examining a lot of the educational priorities. I would state quite flatly that I would like to see education have a higher spending priority than it has had in the last three years. I think the problem we run into is that education is seen as a social service by many people. It's not. It's a basic part of infrastructure and a very important part of our future economic development. And I think when we look at it in those terms, it's easier to develop the political consensus which su supports spending on education. Well, you, you, after all, Mr. Van der Zand, uh, somebody, I think it was McGee, threw in the other day, $600 million excellence fund. Surely they are That's planning over to do years. something. Well, it's, I'm interested to hear what Kim says, what her views are. I'd like to know what the party's views are. We have a platform on education, and the first thing we say is that we would end the cutbacks. That's the first point. The second point is that we would repeal the education financing legislation, which centralizes government, the uh, education issues in government in Victoria. We would re uh, return control to local school boards. Those are commitments that we make. Thirdly, we make a commitment to a public inquiry on education in the province, where the people of the province can say what they think about the sorry state of education left to us by Bennett and now Van der Zam. Kim? The, the very Van der Zam, incidentally, that you had to fight when you were on the school board. And I rec recollect you saying that then, that it was a pain in the ass to be referred <gasps> to as a Socrates. In 1982. You didn't say that, did you? I don't remember, but I used, used to say all sorts of intemperate things under pressure. Well, well on education, you don't really have a platform at what? all, do you? Except this we 600 platform, million you know, excellence what, thing. What, what muddies the issue in talking about education in this province is the unholy political alliance between the BCTF and the NDP. The BCTF, <laughs> which provides a considerable amount of funding towards the NDP. I haven't and seen what any that of it. has what that has resulted in is the redefinition of education in this province as a question of money. That the whole process of education is looked at in terms of dollars and people have gotten totally away from the question of what we're doing in our schools. We're spending more money than ever. This government's record of spending on education is very defensible. But people are still unhappy with what's going on in the schools. Okay. So what I have advocated and what I advocated very strongly throughout the leadership campaign was a whole reorganization of our educational planning system. People out there are not happy. The mm. teachers have taken the position through their political organ that it's money and that, that money should go into teachers' salaries. I think teachers should be well paid. I think they do a good job. But that's not the whole issue. We're paying them better. They're the highest paid salaried professionals in Canada. That doesn't solve the malaise in our public There's education system. There's one Van der Zand platform which really worries me considerably as a basic small-d Democrat. 
maybe vouchers, taxis, <laughs> your school taxis to the private school of your choice. Would you go along with well, that I don't think in that any way, shape, or form? I haven't heard the Premier advocate that. Twice, I've, twice I've asked him. Once he advocated, twice I've asked him. In and recent given, times? Yes, yes, recent times. Well, since, he wouldn't have my support for that. You'd go against Thanks. him on no, this. I don't but of course, you I and... I want to tell her, uh, tell Kim though, that uh, I haven't seen a single teacher in my campaign. I've seen no BCTF. My, You're what all I've running seen, as candidates for what your I've party. Seen, I, I haven't seen any, any. How many women are running in your party? Twenty-one. How many are running in I your think party? About five. About five. Should be more. I agree. The teachers should have the right to strike. You say? That's absolutely right. That's appalling, isn't it, Kim? I don't agree with that. Yeah. Neither do I. I believe in pre-collective bargaining, and the ultimate in pre-collective bargaining is to withdraw your labor if. You don't get the hell with the, society. If you don't get. It's not a question of the hell with society. Responsible collective bargaining means collective agreements. Kim, again, I thank you for going against the advice of the social credit headquarters. Now we'll go to the phones. I want to clarify that no one. Is Kim Campbell, Point Grey Social Credit, David Vickers, Saanich and the Islands, correct? That's correct. I just finished the series, eight broadcasts with eight tribal leaders from British Columbia claiming vast areas of BC. You would, of course, negotiate and settle the claims forthwith. We've, well, forthwith may be a little bit uh, <coughs> presumptuous, but what we've said for years now is that uh, we have to negotiate and we have to negotiate with the native people with the federal government as party, with local municipalities if they're affected, and any other groups of people that are affected. Oh, well, now, wait a minute. Now, this, now, here we're getting into my bailiwick here. Because, in fact, your party has taken the same position that the social credit government has taken. And Dave Barrett wrote in a letter in 1975 that when the federal government makes clear that they will accept responsibility for funding claims for land, uh, Aboriginal title claims, that the provincial government will, will negotiate those claims. But the big problem is that it's a federal responsibility, both constitutionally and by the terms of union. How can we, as a province, negotiate a deal that the federal government has a responsibility of paying for? Now, what I think is important in the Aboriginal area, and I'm very pleased to see that the Premier picked up on it, and that was something that I argued throughout the leadership, is that there are, in fact, a lot of Native bands in this province who have concerns about their economic development who are not interested in land claims. Who, who, who in fact are, are very, very turned off by the idea of large cash settlements to their, to their bands, which they feel can be very, uh, very disruptive. And during the leadership campaign, I in fact visited with Native leaders in three villages in the Prince Rupert area. Oh, but just a minute. I mean, you, you're very sophisticated on this, but when I listened to yeah. Brian Smith speaking for the government of the province of British Columbia as Attorney General, I thought, oh my God, a, nothing but... Absolute that's, blind Kim, wall. that's a Johnny-come-lately position. No, and, and it's you talk not. About, it's, you also what talk I'm about saying is, no, what I'm saying is this, that one of the reasons why there is such, I think, an adamant push towards land claims, and I think, I mean, I'm convinced of the correctness of our legal position, and so have all of the governments of British Columbia, including your own parties, about the reality of, of the existence of There's Aboriginal reality. The law in British Listen. Columbia now, well, let me finish, because you had your say before. The law in British Columbia now, is that there is no unextinguished Aboriginal title in, in British Columbia. And that is the law that the government operates by. But every lawyer who goes into politics, and we're both lawyers in politics, has to recognize that not all legal problems can be solved legally. And, and the, political, the political answer has to be to open avenues of communication. And, and, and that's what the Premier the is doing now. And to stay away from the courts. Well, you and what can't we've stay got away from, from Brian Smith courts. is a courtroom answer. You can't and courtroom stay away from the courts work. when other people are suing you. Well, you can stay away from the courts by declaring that you're prepared to negotiate. Brian's position was no negotiation from the beginning. We and one other point, my turn now. The my turn title now. Question because my it's turn now. You talk, about, you talk about going to Prince Rupert where there are treaties. I live in an area where there are treaties. But this government. There are treaties in the villages I was There are two treaties in Rupert made, made by Douglas, and there are 12 on, on, on the island. This government is in a lawsuit now where it's denying Douglas's ability to, to negotiate on behalf of the Queen. Just and to the Sanichton uh, people in, in my riding, they're saying there's no treaty, and a treaty has existed for over 100 years. As far, as the, man in, like the, as far as the man in the street is concerned, with the patent claims for 70% of the Indian land claims in British Columbia, somebody wants some politician to act and get these claims into what appears to be a reasonable settlement, exactly. and nobody's doing a well, damn thing quite now. quite frankly, that I mean, I lay, the, I lay the blame of this at the door of the federal government. Fair enough. We'll leave that I topic. I with Brian Smith, without any question you at all. You say fair, you say well, Brian Smith. Well, he wasn't advising your government in 1975, so... We were dealing with the cut-off lands. You know that. We well, settled we a lot of the cut-off. Well, so did we. One last word on the minimum wage. Should we bother about... You'd raise it a buck, 
and you would have an investigation and maybe expunge it from some areas, mm -hmm. right? You're Minimum wage that? goes to the whole question of poverty, how you can't raise it, how you can ask people to live below the poverty level and work at wages but below the poverty the level in this day and age is appalling. I'm going to the phones. Go ahead, please. Yes, thank you, Jack. Uh, you, you've already asked one of my questions on minimum wage, but I'd just like to thank you for having a show like this uh, where candidates can answer, publicly answer, and discuss issues. And debate with each other. That's David, right, too. David Poole, are you listening? David Poole. <laughs> one <laughs> one of the other things that these two team. candidates <laughs> have, in, have in common is that, uh, as you know, they're both lawyers, and they both used to work for the uh, same Vancouver law firm. I didn't know that. That's right. Yeah. What I'd like to ask uh, both yeah, candidates. Yeah, let's give them um, a plug. Yeah, Ladner down. Ladner down. I was reading for 15 years. Years. And I was there for two years. Okay, give me a question. Where's your question? What happened to him? We probably talked over his question. I think he looked for question. the plug. No, I'm here. Oh. Go on, ask a question. What are you? He's <laughs> definitely gone. He's gone now, anyway. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm really sorry to see that Premier Slanderdam is not doing... Uh, his bet by having a, a debate and uh, while saying that he wants op open government. But I'm wondering uh, if both uh, candidates could uh, make a comment on the uh, advertisements that the Socreds have been running on television lately. Which one? I'm unable to because I haven't seen them. I d I, the I, only one I I've seen is this one. I never watched I, Well, I, I watched the government commercials, which I think uh, are an appalling, <laughs> abuse of, appalling abuse of public spending. Well, that's what I call so credit. Oh, the, oh well, if you're talking about spending public funds, my money, to advertise uh, for the social credit government, that's a breach of trust. Always has been, never will change. And Van der Zandt is doing that, you say? And, uh, and so did Bennett, both of them. Oh, Bennett, they made a career And Van der Zandt's doing it with his face now. Change the faces, but there's the same breach of trust. You were in the Premier's office. Yeah, I was. No doubt about it. All these never shot any commercials with me in them, unfortunately. I wonder why not. I don't know. What about the abuse of uh, spending, though? What about the re uh, what about sp spending people's money for advertising social credit government policies? Well, I think in this day and age, television is one of the most important media of communication. But don't you think the government should use television to communicate? But all the people who don't vote for you don't want you to spend their money that way. What 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 about the hundreds of thousands of dollars spent since the last election by the social credit government on advertising? in the manner which touts their ministers. You mean you, they should advertise, but they shouldn't mention the it's ministers' not, names? Nothing wrong with saying what government services are, but what's wrong? But to tout it and have the minister there and to have Mr. Van Der Zand up and talking about expo debt that doesn't exist, or if it does exist, somehow it's going to evaporate by waving a wand, well, that I, is an abuse I can of public appreciate, spending. I can appreciate why members of the opposition would be aggravated by, by seeing government ministers I hope on a lot television. Of I believe but those a lot of ministers are there because they are elected by the people of British Columbia to perform a public function. Oh, and they communicate about that function in a number of different ways. They communicate about it in public meetings with people. They Next communicate question. it through the media. Next question. Oh, there's a guy on the phone, but one question. We don't need conflict of interest regulations, do we? I mean, it's perfectly all right, as long as the guy's a successful businessman, just to carry on with whatever he's doing. Is that well, right? Of course we need regulations, but, they, but they're what very they difficult to set down. You know, we actually had fairly, fairly tough ones here compared to other places where they have guidelines well, because the, the guidelines have no clear uh, well, legal sanctions attached I'm to them. I'm delighted that you admit that they're fairly tough ones. I happen to be part of the draftsman of the well, legislation from 74, but they're not more. tough enough. And, and, and Premier agree. Bennett said there were going to be new guidelines, and Premier Van Der Zandt worked on. I've and seen we want to see them. them before the election, so we have a chance to comment on them. Are they going to come before but the election? No. But What's wrong with giving people stuff before the election? But if they're, but if they're tougher the than the ones that you drafted yourselves, how can you possibly object? I'd like to see them before the election. Well, look at Bill so Van Der Zandt. He talks about decentralizing the ALI when he still conceivably has a conflict of interest. Yeah, but he's abandoned any further claims under the ALR. I mean, he's accepted their ruling. They want to yeah. After, he, after he's ha but, but, having but built if, on the on the land. But if he has the, but you know, if he runs into a problem, he'll be publicly accountable for it. Go ahead, please. Oh, I got snubbed. <laughs> you give us more time for phones. This after is the hot break. stuff. We're short circuiting your telephones. <laughs> Kim Campbell and David Vickers. Go ahead, please. Hello. That's you, ma'am. Yes, I'm a Vancouver teacher, and I just wanted to respond to the statement that Kim Campbell made that uh, BC teachers are the highest paid professionals in the country. And I just wanted to state that the... Salaried professionals. 
The BCTF has just published figures to show that our salary scales are the lowest of any province in Canada. Would she like to respond to that? Well, I said teachers are the highest paid salary professionals in Canada, and I'm sorry if I misrepresent your salaries. But I do want to say that when you travel around the province, it's very important to recognize that for many people in this province, teachers' salaries represent a level that they just cannot aspire to. When you go into communities in the interior resource communities where the employment is 20 percent, it's very hard politically for a government to justify increases in salaries to teachers. Well, well, the interesting thing is, is the turn of phrase, the highest paid salaried professionals. It means that other professional people, like nurses, I suppose, uh, uh, should be kept down at the level they're at. No, I'd but like the to other, see nurses paid more, But the, uh, the, other, the other problem, uh, uh, of course, is that what we get is we lose teachers as a result of this kind of attitude, which has them ninth in the country, as this teacher has indicated. We lose good teachers, and we're then prepared to take what's at the bottom of the barrel, and but that's simply see, not acceptable. Our teacher salaries have always been very competitive with the rest of the country until the last few years. In the last few years, British Columbia went through a recession. We were the so province that was the most hard hit by the recession. And I now hear coming out of Alberta the very same arguments that you're hearing in British Columbia because of the, the crisis in the oil industry. The recession as well. Ontario has a growth rate the, of 6%. The, reco the recovery, though, hasn't come in this province. And the recovery hasn't we come totally because of economic social credit no. policy. Right, we have There's a totally no different economic that. structure. Okay, here. enough on that one. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Kim, congratulations on getting the nomination last night. Thank you. Um, as a uh, UBC student, I was quite pleased to see you, the Premier, and Dr. McGeer out on campus today. Uh, you've got a, I'm glad you got a good reception, contrary to what Mr. Skelly received it the other day. Uh, I'd like to ask you, um, firstly, uh, how do you feel on, on making uh, courses from community level, college level, transferable to university? Because right now there's, there's uh, several that are... Aren't, uh, okay, does that I'm make sure, sense to you? Yeah, I'm sure Jack doesn't think this is the hottest issue of the day, but I do think that the, the failure to dovetail those programs is really an abdication of responsibility by the institutions. They have all these articulation committees set up to do just that. And yes, I think that that's a problem that should be dealt with right away. Thank you. Nothing to add to that. No. You. Go ahead, please. Uh, hi, Kim. Good afternoon. Oh, Kim's popular tonight. Kim's popular. I um, really enjoyed your speech at the convention, and uh, it was particularly... Uh, the phrase, charisma without substance is a dangerous thing. Oh, and uh, here you are running as a candidate for the social credit party. Yeah. Were you talking about Bill Van Der Zandt when you said charisma without substance? The, uh, the whole statement that I made, I loved everybody jumped on it, I never uh, attributed it to any particular person, was that it is fashionable to talk about politicians in terms of their charisma. Charisma without substance is a dangerous thing. It leads to, I think, disillusionment, whatever that can destroy the party. Okay. I wasn't. I wasn't attacking any particular. I agree uh, with the statement. Just a minute. What do you think say? I agree with the statement. Yeah, I think I, it's I true. Think I think charisma I think it's without substance is a dangerous thing, and that's precisely what we're facing in this problem. What today. do you mean we're facing? Well, it, I'm speaking of Bill Van, Van Der Zam. Uh, there's no question at all that there's no substance. It's all charisma. What I was and talking it's a about. Thing. What I was talking about at Whistler was that many people were talking, and not just about Bill Van Der Zam. We're, you're talking about charisma. This it certainly wasn't talking charisma. about Bud Smith, were they? No. No charisma. Brian Smith. If they say they weren't no talking charisma. about me. I will cry. <laughs> but they were talking those terms, and I felt that that's not the way you look at, at, at a politician. Have you asked a question, caller? Uh, well, I was going to ask um, if um, we're not experiencing charisma without substance now. We have the Premier who says, I'm running on style, not uh, issues. Style and uh, substance. Perhaps Kim can give us some specific areas of substance. Well, uh, let me just say, maybe, first of uh, all. Something like reforestation, and I mean, mm -hmm. like, how many jobs and how much is it going to cost? And how about an area like youth unemployment? Uh, can you know, I give us something specific, dollars and cents. What are we talking about? Uh, well, let's have some substance, please. First of all, I want to make a distinction between charisma and style. Charisma is a relationship between a leader and followers where people simply abandon their okay. rational I've qualities. I've got that, but style I want Style reflects only got a, a genuine minutes. approach to problems. If somebody what? has a warm, open style, that reflects their basic approach to the problems what of life. Do you think of the ND, the what thing. do you think of the NDP party, that every young person must be guaranteed a job or schooling or training, and that job security should be legislated, and that's aimed right at the IWA contracting out issue? What do you think of those NDP provinces, promises? Not a great deal. Is that all you have to say about them? 
Well, they're highly we're talking responsible in, in the youth, that. In the youth, <laughs> in the youth uh, program, Jack, we're talking about a process. We're talking about a process which eventually will see young people not uh, layabouts and without work, but with either schooling or a job or both. Guaranteed by the government. Guaranteed by the government because they are our richest resource. Um, our young people are our richest resource, and they are being abandoned today, in my view, to the streets by a government that is insensitive well, to the needs of these young kids. Well, I don't think that's true. Well, but talk I, to but the kids. I, but I certainly agree that it's very important to provide for all young people, and not just young people, uh, older people, because education is a, uh, is a retraining process now because our, our lives change so quickly and the economy changes, that that is a very high priority and it's essential to economic development okay. to try to provide it. Go ahead, caller. Hi. That's you. Well, yeah, I'd just like to know why uh, Mr. Van Der Zand is afraid of debating Mr. Skelly on TV. Why do, you, just a minute, why do you think he's afraid? Because he, he'll, he'll be shown as a person without substance, a person of style and a person of charisma, but without substance. Nothing to say to the people, nothing to offer the people, and Bob, who has the policies of this party well planned, well looked at, and is ready to articulate them, of course will show as the preferable person to be Premier of this province. Well, I think on the contrary that Mr. Van Der Zem knows that if he appears in a debate with Mr. Skelly, the ratings will be considerably higher than a solo appearance on television True. by Mr. Skelly. And he doesn't wish to provide Mr. Skelly with that uh, audience. And frankly, and I don't mean to be unkind, but Mr. Skelly has not shone particularly in that kind of a setting recently. And I would think that perhaps he's grateful that the Premier is refusing to debate him on television. Well, I, I, I don't see it that way at all. I think it's just he's afraid of Bob, and I don't think there's any question about that. Well, Bob's had a couple of unfortunate incidents. He has, but he, at least when Bob faces uh, uh, Bill Van Der Zam, he'll have something to say. A man of style and charisma will have no substance to what's being said, and people will see that matched together, and that's what he's afraid of. Is that valid that you have no new Van Der Zam platform for social credit, just ad hocery by the day? Well, he's only been in the office a very short period of time, but what I think he has set out is a very significant broad approaches to And he has done some good things. I think so. I think he's, he's shown... He settled the BCGEU yes. strike. He's going to settle the HLRA. You see, you see that's, stuck with that's the IWA. style. That shows that style is not the same as charisma. Style is an approach to problems. Non-confrontational. And in politics, the issues change rapidly. And that is why very often people look to someone's style and personal essence because they don't know four years down the, the line what the issues strike, will be. Jack, was settled by John Shields being the leader of a union that was prepared Smart to accept. Smart enough to wait for the new leader. And it was oh, a classic, a classic piece of good collective bargaining by a very, very able person with an able executive that did a first-rate job for all of the people. Of this you province. must admit, though, and it's time that somebody looked at Shields and his team as being at least 50 percent of making that contract. Except that Van der Zam stepped in and put up the money. I think, and I Bennett think Bill, could have done that. I think Wouldn't. Bill. I think Bill Van der Zam, in fact, gave credit to John Shields. I, I think he was very it, complimentary. He, he was great. complimentary That's to others. Yes. But you must concede that the Van der Zam has done one thing. I think everyone must concede this. He's got a pleasant, gracious personality, right. which is almost non-confrontational. I know Bill very well. I, I remember I used to work with him. He was Minister of Human Resources. I was Deputy Attorney General. We had a lot to do with each other. And, uh, and we, I think, got on very well. We also, I think, know each other very well. And I know him to be a man who will not follow through on anything. You mean he'll be no good province. as Premier with he power? He will not be a good Premier for this province. And I, uh, frankly, he'll be a great leader of the opposition, and that's what he's going to be. Last word to you, Kim. Piffle. Piffle. Good last uh, word. Thanks again tonight for, because I was perturbed when I had this strange, dreadful advice from, I couldn't David, let you down. from David Poole. I knew you I'll wouldn't do anything either. for a new coffee mug. Thank you very much. <laughs> you may have a coffee mug. <laughs> My thanks. Next, Thank you, Jack. Uncle Harry and Gordon Campbell, after the break. The choice is clear for Vancouver voters in November. You either go to the bright young man of considerable civic experience, experience as a developer, experience as a politician, or you go to old Uncle Harry Rankin, who's been around a thousand years, 20 years, and who is quite predictable. Harry, I want you to drop that mask of pleasant appearance. I do on occasion, you know. Well, you tell me why he should not be elected mayor of Vancouver. Well, I can tell you that it's not because of his youth. It's not because of his experience. I think it's because he represents basically a right-wing position in the sense that he acts for the developers mainly. His training, 
his education and his background. Nothing to do with age. It's nothing to do with experience necessarily. He represents it's the liberals to the right and you represent the NDP to the far left. I represent COPE. That's right, I represent COPE, not the NDP. I represent COPE. And do you think because of a, a political complexion that he should be rejected? Yes, I think I've got the experience. Mr. Campbell, what do you say to that old-fashioned attack on you? I say that's an old-fashioned attack that is not f uh, founded on anything like substance. I think it's the message that we've been trying to hear and we've been trying to get across. Uh, I think to say that I represent de developers is nonsense. I think I represent neighborhoods, I represent people, and uh, I'm going to continue doing that. Now, if Rankin becomes mayor, though, what will happen to the city of Vancouver? Will fiscal responsibility go out the window? We have an excellent city staff, and I'm sure that Alderman Rankin would agree with me on that. We have an excellent director of finance. I believe we have to have a council that's more actively involved in the budgeting process. I believe we have to have a council that more actively deals with the choices that we have to make and that respects the effort it takes to earn a dollar before they spend it. What are the issues now, though? For instance, you've been attacked from the light many a time because you will not reduce city staff, you will not deal with non-union firms, and uh, you say that you can create jobs in the city when the taxpayers are so hard-pressed. Is it not now the time for some restraint and letting some of the non-union people in somewhere? Well, the non-union people are in, of course, because of the situation today, the undercutting, etc. But let me tell you something. We've had restraint in this province in the provincial level. Mega projects all over, pretty rich for our blood. Do you know of any mega projects in Vancouver in the 20 years that we've been there that have made any kind of fiscal irresponsibility? The fact of the matter is we have the AAA credit rating. We have not laid off any civic voters, uh, workers when it was fashionable and the cry from Campbell, uh, Alderman Campbell and his friends, lay off staff, etc. Baker wanted 1,000. Uh, uh, Van der Zandt would have laid off 2,000. Uh, anybody they got there, that was the fashion. They found it didn't work and Alderman Campbell was going to lay off workers as well. He tried it on That's for right. size with the with the garbage workers, et cetera, found that that didn't, also you know, that did not okay, work. Is he okay. accurate or not no, accurate? it's totally inaccurate. Uh, we have, I have constantly called for the city to maintain services. I have also constantly called for the city to try and get the best value we can for the tax dollar. I think the attitude that the only thing you can do is lay off staff uh, in order to govern properly is ridiculous. The fact of the matter is uh, I have supported our city staff. I think we have good staff. I have not called for the laying off of garbage workers or the contracting out. I did call for, in uh, I believe it was January of this year, for the staff to review uh, opportunities to get better value for our tax dollar, and I think that's the responsibility that we all have in government, period. Do you agree that Rankin was opposed to almost everything, the Dome Stadium, the development of Granville Island, Expo, the Camby Street Bridge, Canada Place, is that right? Is that right, Ali? No, that's not right. I can't, I've got not that, that's bad not right. The, I you dead against I, Expo. That's right. Absolutely, I, I felt, totally. I felt that the, the billion dollars spent there could have been spent better elsewhere when the decision, after all, I'm entitled to an opinion. In fact, that's what the people elect you for, to have an opinion. But you were wrong on Expo. No, I was not Judy wrong was, on the was Expo. I believe he was the wrong billion Expo. dollars that has been spent, now we will see, after October the 13th, whether that was well spent or otherwise. Once it was decided on, I did nothing to impede it. I simply said to the people, you're going to have to look at that billion dollars over the next 25 years And or the so. city ain't going to pay none of it. But you would even Aren't they going to pay none of it? The city has paid millions of dollars. On Camby Street Bridge? In, no, on policing, roads, garbage pickup, sidewalks. We spent right. three, four, did five million. Did Expo bring any business to Vancouver? Expo of course it did. a ton of business. Save people from going bankrupt? Well, we, we've created $85,000 in the city of Vancouver in the last 85, year. 85,000 jobs, sorry, in the last year. Have we? There. A great number of that is attributable to Expo 86, City Council report done by the Social Planning Department last Thursday. <laughs> 85,000, that would include in the, the 70,000. That includes the people that are employed by Expo. Expo. The important thing about Expo is it does give us a platform that we can build on. We have had a million visitors come from California, as I've said. 700,000 have not been in Vancouver before. We have to build on that. We have to maintain the thrust and the energy and the activity that's been generated by Expo. Do you do you approve this these unseemly displays when American warships come into the City and Harry, of course, is in there. 
attacking them all the time. I believe I've attacked the question of nuclear armed warships, not sailors or anything else. I'm for world peace. So am I. Are you for world peace? For oh, world peace. We're all for yes. world peace. Oh, but wait a minute. To be for world peace doesn't mean braying like a jackass in the field. To be for world peace means to do step by step things that will bring world peace. Not just saying, I'm for it. I, I As a matter of fact, Gordon Campbell has voted yeah, against yeah. a lot of I, peace initiatives. I've, well, I've I would too, because you annoy me with your peace initiatives. They're so standard. I don't well, mind before annoying you. Before you it, it's a great pleasure an to annoy you. About what I vote for and don't vote for. I have voted against two peace resolutions. One, which Alderman Rankin has uh, done in an ad, suggested I was against the walk, the march for peace, uh, because I voted against the establishment of another peace committee. I think Alderman Rankin knows this, and all he has to do is look at the record, and he's obviously spent some time with it. The That's council right. voted unanimously to supply the funding for the last two walks for peace. 14,000, right. I believe it was, in 1985, and uh, 20,000 in 1986. Yes, after we pushed I, just, them I would like to go it. back to talk to the, uh, you didn't push me at all, I agreed to it. Uh, the, as far as the warships are concerned, the council took what I thought was a constructive act. They said, we do not, we are concerned about nuclear war. We would like the government to explain to us what the situation is with regard to our allies in NATO and with re regard to our NATO commitments. And that's the way we should handle that so we can be constructive, so we can get to a solution instead of braying at each other politically. I okay. agree with that. A, sp a specific, after the expo, what's going to happen to the north side of False Creek? Well, the initiative that I'd like to see is to speed up. You know, after expo, there's going to be a lot of people laid off. No argument about that. There'll be 25, 30,000 jobs go. I, the way that you're going to take up that slack is develop the north side of Falls Creek. The position now is to do it very slowly over, or incrementally over 20 years. I think we're going to have to condense that time What do you want to down. see on the north side? What do you want to see there? I want to see Housing, strong, hotels? strong residential neighborhoods between the Canby Street Bridge and the Granville Street Bridge. I would like to see the residential development that was unanimously agreed to by Council in North Park to go ahead so we can have an expansion, expansion of Chinatown. I would like them to do some work on developing a festival park at the east end of the, of, the, of the creek next to the Expo Center, and I would like to see them look at the possibility of ca containing the folk lights. Do you agree with them on that? Well, I want to be a little more specific. I think we should have about 35% that we should have the same relationship of social housing to housing on the south side, of of, uh, north side of Falls Creek as we had on the south side of Falls Creek, because if we don't do that, the people that are going to live there are not going to be able to, uh, you know, are going a to be A couple of short, sharp questions. I'm your both people. ashamed in Vancouver City Council that we, I think, are still putting up barriers to delineate the areas for prostitutes. We're well, doing that. No, I'm we're not delineating no, we're not areas for prostitutes. What are you doing? No. It's, it's a shame on the city. We are dealing with certain things in the way that they have to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. If you, it's not the prostitutes that create the problem. They're the magnet, but it's that endless traffic. And if you lived in a neighborhood where your sleep was disturbed instead of some penthouse on the 55th floor somewhere paying about five thousand dollars a month rent if you live with the ordinary peasants you see the you smear? might you see might cheap smear uh, you might, i was not going to you ask might you suffer if the city of and Vancouver you might want the barriers. should have a mayor who can't cross the border into the united states i could cross, you cannot cross i could cross by simply phoning down and getting permission Bruce a visa. Yorko, and i'm not going to till they let me go across like every other country the hell them that's right. At least you won't twin us with Los Angeles, more likely with Havana. I don't really care whether we twin with Los Angeles or not, but the fact of the matter is, uh, if they want me down there to visit, they'll just let me go across, and that'll be the end of the matter. What was the last mayoralty result in terms of numbers? Oh, I think uh, Harcourt got about, what, 79,000, votes? Two to one, I guess, with uh, Van Der Zandt. Can you win? I sure hope I can win. I'm going to work hard enough to win. If you lose, you're finished. I'm not you like Skelly. If you lose this election, you're dead. I am not dead. I've got a profession to go to, and I've got a political life in front of me. I'm not dead at all. Well, it's not the oldest listen, profession. I, it's the second hey, oldest listen, profession. Listen, there's a saying, <laughs> send not to know for whom the bell tolls. Ask I've outlived, not. ask not. For I've, whom the bell I've, tolls. I've outlived a lot of people. It tolls and for I've thee. I've planned to outlive a lot of other people. Questions down to Gordon Campbell and Harry Rankin. Both friends of mine, I think, up to a point. After the break. Thirty-eight, Gordon Campbell. Sixty-eight, Harry Rankin. Sixty-six. Oh, I'm sorry. I do apologize. Don't worry. I don't worry about it. I earned every year of it. 
And you look at, go ahead, please. I look at. Yeah, one uh, question just to Mr. Campbell. I wonder if you would bring the same sort of morality to civic government as mayor that you brought to your NPA convention or your nominating meeting in the backroom deal where you asked Mr. Huey to withdraw. I thought it was a disgraceful performance. I saw you on the television news trying to explain that away. Is this the sort of double dealing that we can expect from you as mayor? You can expect me to uh, admit when I've made a mistake and to get on with the job that's, that's at hand, yes. Go ahead, please. Yeah, um, Mr. Rankin, I'd just like to ask you a question. Uh, yes. Basically, uh, prior to Expo, uh, you were so dead against uh, the hotels uh, uh, and you come down on the provincial government for it. I wonder, a man who is so proud of being in there for 20 years, why you would let the hotels get into the shape they were. Obviously, your inspectors and whatnot were not doing sense. the job. I don't see the problem with... Uh, and well, U.S. Minister Burnaby, North Shore, and Richmond. Uh, well, you're quite wrong, of course. There's problems in all of those places, but not as great as in Vancouver. The hotels in Vancouver are run down. Cope's uh, position on that over the 20 years, and mine, when I was by myself on council, was to fight for the standards of maintenance bylaws, to fight to upgrade those hotels. And if anybody looks at my record, even my enemies, they will say that I have expended tremendous energy in the cleaning up of the sleazy hotels that are there. That's the hey. truth. In Vancouver, Especially we after the, yes. the expo. Just a minute. Go on. In Vancouver, we have, in fact, uh, been very good, I think, at trying to enforce our standard of maintenance bylaws and our fire and health and safety bylaws. Yes, and it was COPE that put in the standard of maintenance bylaws. Alex and nearly drove us all crazy. That's Actually, right, just but to the, get the fact the of the matter right. is... Art Phillips in 1973, no, his no. inaugural address, you can go it, back and read it. It may be the inaugural address. Mike it Harcourt's was, special it was, committee it was, on housing. It was Check the, the efforts of Erickson in Gera Fair enough. and carried on by Cope in Council. And we and have a, a record. Of other Last comment there. from yes, the caller. There are other people. Caller. Oh, it's gone. I'm not handling these phones very well these days. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello. That's you. Yes. Um, I have two questions. First, for Alderman Rankin, we're always hearing about him not being able to go into the States. I'd like to know why. Uh, I would too, but they haven't given me any information Honey, on it. Come on, tell us why. They haven't given me any information you on it. You know why. They, all right, they think that I'm a danger to them. Why do they uh, think you're a danger, Well, Harry? they you're thought... A, you're a very forthright man. I say, they it goes thought... goes back to your young days at UBC, yeah, doesn't it? It may go back to my old days when at you, UBC. You were a member of the but party the, in those days I was UBC. not. I was not. There was no party connection in any way, shape, or but form. But that's why they don't... They think you're that, too far to the left. They think I'm too far to the left. That's Fair right. Enough. But that's not a reason... I can get into any other country in the world. Oh, I think it's disgraceful that you're not allowed in. You know, well, it would really be interesting to know the whole story. My well, you know the whole Alderman story Campbell right now. That his uh, aldermanic team seems to uh, come from a, a wide range of political ideologies and backgrounds. And I wonder what sort of a team that will be. You well, I'll tell you, it'll be a lot more unified team than the NPA that comes from all over the map as well. I think no, excuse me, I'm sorry, this is a question. Oh, it's, okay. Right. it's okay, all right. It's okay, Alderman Rankin's good at talking, he's not as good at listening. Uh, I think I'm we a lot have better a listener very good and a listen, more sensible talker listen, as well. I, listen. I think we have a very good team of people, and I think the job of the mayor is to pull them together and make sure everyone that's elected works together, and that's what I'm going to do. Have you any mayor. political warnings that if they were to sweep the city council like they swept uh, school board? Well, I have a political warning that I think that we have to move on, as we've, we've, I've suggested. I think we have to build on the strengths that we have, and I think that the team of people I've put together at the MPA and that I'm working with at the MPA can do that best. It is. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a ragtag uh, army, isn't it? I'll make the nasty remarks, Mr. Rankin, please. I'm senior well, to you in years to. and ages. The Carol Taylor not thing was a real bad boo-boo. You're going to change the regulations for next year? Uh, the Board of Directors has already said that they are going to look at that and change it for the next year. Carol's going to run as independent? I understand she is, yes. understand. You know yes. she is. She is running. She announced but on she, Friday she, she is running as an independent. That. She's not on your campaign material. No, she's not, but it's I think she's a very good candidate and has a very good chance of winning. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes. I'd like to uh, ask a question of Harry. Yes. I've uh, heard a little bit about the, the capital plan, and Harry being the, the head of the finance committee, um, I wondered what he had planned about this uh, capital plan for Vancouver. I know we're going to vote on it. Well, let's get the capital well, plan first of all. It's one, uh, what is it, one million, what is it? A hundred and forty-three million forty-three million dollars. Forty-three million dollars. Do right. people have to vote for all of it or parts of it? They can vote for it. There's four different sections of the capital plan. Is there any section you're against? No, there is no section that Any I'm against. Any section you're against? No, you voted against two sections of it, though. I did not vote against any sections you of the... You voted against 
the four million dollars. It is and not a section of the capital plan. Well, Alderman it, all right, then you're just quibbling. You're just quibbling, and you voted the against facts. the four hundred thousand dollars roughly for the libraries. Yes. So those are the two sections you voted against. The question at Boma, you you didn't even lead the people by saying vote for it. You were talking to them there. You you talked on about the capital plan, and at the end of it, you didn't say vote for it or against it. You know, you remember that? I remember that. Let yes. me now explain it, if I may, right, without your ahead. editorial comments. What I have said about the capital plan is that I support it. What I have said is I think that every taxpayer should look at the cost of it. What I have said is the suggestion that it's only going to cost $67 to the average taxpayer is going to be misleading, and they should check what the cost is. What I said at Bona, BOMA is small businesses are going to look at a cost of $530 and up from five small businesses that I looked at. I believe, that, I, believe, just a minute, just a minute, I believe that everyone should look at the, at the capital plan and decide how they feel about it. I support it. I think that it's important that we get on with it. But it's their tax dollars, and I think they have a responsibility well, to decide how much If you're a leader when you're at BOMA, why don't you say that? What you really were saying is you were saying that the homeowner wasn't paying enough and the small business was paying was not too much that at all. because you were speaking to that okay, audience. Okay, caller, do you have a point, caller? to say that. Yeah, uh, yes. Yes. I'd like to uh, say that um, uh, I, you saved sixty some dollars for the for the house uh, householder, and then then five hundred and thirty dollars for the business. That's it, correct. I, I read about this in the paper, and I know that uh, um, they said that it was five hundred and thirty dollars over five years, whereas it was sixty bucks a year for the household. No, in both cases, the sixty seven dollars, which is the mean cost to the average householder, and the five hundred and thirty dollars, which was a cost on a specific piece of property is the total cost at the end of the four-year plan. It, do, it won't happen next year automatically. Go ahead, please. That's right. And don't forget, with the same people talk about the Canby Bridge, it's the same cost, you know, $65 million or $55 million. You know, those are all choices for people. But you see, That's if exactly you don't right. vote for the capital plan, you also put a 500 or so people out of work because it is part of the continuation of the city's business. True? No, I don't that believe that is That is true, true. And, that, and the engineers will tell you that when go you go back tomorrow and find out. Go ahead, Colin. There'll be 500 Hello? people out of work. There won't go be ahead, ma'am. There will. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Campbell a question, please. Mm -hmm. I always thought the mayor was a political job the same as uh, premier or prime minister. How yes. could he possibly turn around and say he wants to take politics out of City Hall? Since when wasn't it a, a mayor political? Well, I think that the mayor is a political leader. What we have to, the politics we have to take out of City Hall is provincial and federal politics, and we have to deal with civic issues, and we have to deal with them from the point of view of what's best for the city of Vancouver. I am tired of people trying to pretend that uh, what the city should do is act as an opposition to Victoria or to Ottawa. What we have to recognize is all of our representatives, whether they're civic, provincial, or federal, have got to get on with the job of doing what's best for Vancouver. And you're saying that Harry Rankin wouldn't get in the front door of Van der Zam's office? The fact I'm of the matter is, I've talked to Van der Zam over 25 years, both at the regional district, at, when he was in the provincial government, and when he was mayor of Surrey. And he'll be a great and, premier. And he will not be a great premier, but the fact of the matter is, I will talk to him when he's in Victoria, because if he's there, that's who I'll talk to. And if Mr. Skelly's there, that's who but I will talk to. you notice he said that but a simple the, majority that would change the charter for a ward system? He said that, Van der Zandt said. But he says everything. Do you want the ward system? It depends yes. the day of the Do year. Do you want He'll the ward system? Yes. You yeah. all want the ward yes. system? Van der Zandt's prepared to give it when he gets his 60 seats. But he can he, change he the charter. He was totally opposed to the ward system. He was totally opposed ah, to the resource board. Non he was totally opposed so to the school system. He was totally opposed to everything, and Hold all of a breath, sudden, Harry he has now changed his mind Hold on your it. Breath, Harry. And he nominated no, him for mayor of this city. My thanks to Gordon Campbell running for mayor and to Harry Rankin just within time running for mayor. Thank you very much. The date much, is Harry. November 15th, 15th Saturday. after the break. Four bright politicians tomorrow Art Cuby, John Reynolds, Robert Gardner, that's uh, the lawyer Gardner running in centre, Doug Sandberg from Richmond, should be good fun. We'll give you election material till it's coming out your ears. Tomorrow at 5 p.m. precisely, stay tuned for the news hour.